Hello everyone, I'm Daz and welcome to American Civil War and UK History Podcast. This presentation is available as a video on YouTube or as a podcast from wherever you get your podcast from. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and TikTok and I am also part of the Unfilled Historian team. You'll find all relevant links in the description below. So, joining me today is a Professor of American History at the University of Cambridge and author Nick Guyot. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, anyway, um, in today's podcast, we are going to be discussing uh, the history behind his latest book, The Hated Cage, which is based around the time of the War of 1812. So, Nick, could you please start by introducing yourself um, and tell us a little bit more about yourself, please? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I grew up in uh, Bristol. Um, so that's where I'm from. And then um, I came here actually to Cambridge, which is where I'm talking to you from now to be an undergraduate. A secret confession for you, Daz, I did not do history as my first degree. I did English literature. So when my students find out, they're very suspicious of me. Anyway, then I carried on and moved over to history. Then I did a PhD in America, went to Princeton uh, in New Jersey, which was amazing. Uh, and then I originally taught in Canada. And this is relevant for our story, I promise. But I taught in Canada for three years out in Vancouver. Then I came back and taught at the University of York. And then finally, I came to the job I'm in right now at Cambridge in 2014. And the, the reason it's relevant to see me as someone in all three of these countries, Britain, Canada, and the US, is as you know, Daz, the War of 1812 involves those three countries in a really important way, but nobody can agree in those three countries on what the war is about or on who won. So I've actually taught the War of 1812 in Britain, the US, and in Canada. So at this point, like I've got a different story for each country. Awesome. That's cool. So, okay, let's start then with the War of 1812 and give everybody a brief overview of that history of that war. Sure. Well, let's talk about Britain, first of all. As you know, Britain gets to the War of 1812 after it's already been at war with France for nearly 20 years. So the brief exception of a little year or so window at the start of the 1800s, where there's brief peace between Britain and France, Britain has been battling the French since just after the French Revolution. And of course, at this point, by 1812, Britain has spent like 10 years or so fighting Napoleon. So Britain doesn't necessarily need or even really want the War of 1812. On the US side, though, the US has spent almost all of that time while Britain's been fighting France as a brand new nation trying to become a neutral power. So the American vision is let's let all the European powers fight each other. And then let's just be the neutral power that's trading with all of them. And this is a really big opportunity for the Americans because, you know, all sorts of basic stuff that usually happens in Europe, like growing crops and grain and stuff like that, all that's disrupted by the war. So the Americans basically want to sell a ton of stuff. They want to sell fish. They want to sell grain. They want to sell wheat, all of this into Europe. But both Britain and France are not interested in respecting the neutrality of the Americans. They don't like it that America is trying to trade with their big rival in Europe. So for a variety of reasons and in a variety of ways, the British and the French are interfering with American shipping. So by the time you get to 1812, the Americans have pretty much had enough of this. And then the other factor of this, the other part of this from the American side, is that there's been a low level war going on in the Great Lakes region. So what these days we think of as being like the Midwest, so kind of Michigan, and then across into Canada, which of course is British then, there's been this low level war between Native Americans and between US settlers. Now, the Brits have been kind of intervening to help out the Native Americans. And again, the US government absolutely hates that. So you've got the Native American context, you've got the Atlantic shipping context, this neutrality problem. And those two things come together in the summer of 1812. And James Madison, the American president, finally decides that the only way to make Britain respect the United States is by declaring war. So in June of 1812, Congress starts that war, and that war then runs all the way through until February of 1815. And I can say a little bit more about the outcome of the war, if you like, or I could tell you a bit more how it gets started. Well, so, I mean, in a way, this is a weird war, because the first plan on the American side is, let's invade Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just go and take the Canadian provinces, because basically the Canadians will like ditch the Brits if we give them a chance. Now, the Canadians are actually quite keen to carry on being Canadian and not to become American. So actually, the Americans meet quite a lot of resistance there. So that all kind of fizzles out. 
The war up in the Midwest, so this Indian war I mentioned before, the US government is pretty successful in crushing indigenous resistance. So actually that war is kind of over by about 1813, and the US basically kind of wins that war. So this means that that whole area of what's now the Midwest, a huge amount of that gets kind of carved out for American expansion. But on the Atlantic, it's far, far, far less clear who's winning. So you basically have the huge Royal Navy. And again, if you know your history from that period, you'll know the Royal Navy is an amazing kind of kick ass military force. They've got like more than 100 giant capital ships. You know, we're talking about some of these ships with like 800, 900 sailors on. I mean, they're gigantic. They've got loads and loads and loads of those. The US Navy is basically like four medium sized ships and a bunch of gunboats. Like the US Navy is unbelievably crappy. So the Americans decide instead of having a big Navy, they're going to privatize the war at sea. So they're going to say to all of the commercial captains, they're going to say to all of the kind of ordinary sailors and ship owners, why don't you guys put some guns on your ships and go off and fight the British for us? So actually, those ships, they become known as privateers. They're sort of the tip of the sword of the American force at sea during the War of 1812. And here's how we get to the story of, I'm telling my book, a huge amount of these sailors who are on the American side are not in the US Navy. They're basically just on these commercial ships. The ships are turned into privateers, like a privatized Navy. And they end up being captured by the Royal Navy. And then those sailors end up in British custody. And over the course of the War of 1812, we're probably talking about 15,000, 20,000, maybe more sailors who end up in British captivity. OK. And you gave me goosebumps when you said about the British Navy then. That made me really proud to be British for that. Oh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not kidding, Daz. I mean, these are monsters. Oh. These ships are enormous. Yeah, like 125 guns, wow. 800 men. I mean, these are ships that can stay at sea for huge periods of time. They are enormous. And the American plan is not to take them on, right? The American plan is let's have a little privatized Navy that goes off and looks for commercial ships, British ships. So merchant ships, not those big Royal Navy ships. And if you get seen by one of those big ships, you're toast. Yeah, like, you rough. see one of those, you're like, okay, <laughs> well, we're going to surrender. Okay, let's move to uh, part of the biggest part of the story, and that is Dartmoor Prison. Now, give us a little bit of history of its location and also um, the history behind why it was built in the first place, please. Yeah, it's totally bonkers, Daz, because, like, if you think about it, like, this is a prison. So, you know, like, now it's a prison for criminals, for convicts. So now the Dartmoor is, like, the oldest prison in the British system still working. They're supposed to shut it next year. They've abandoned that. <laughs> so Dartmoor has basically been a criminal prison since 1853. But it was built in 1809 specifically to house prisoners of war. And you probably figured this out from what I said before, but generally speaking, in a conflict back then, the idea was if you have an equal number of prisoners on each side that get taken, you just swap them over. And back in those days when everyone was, there were more innocent times, Daz, you could basically get the prisoners to swear that they wouldn't fight again in the war, and then you just exchange them, right? So that's okay. basically how you deal with prisoners of war. But what happens if one side takes way more prisoners than the other. And here's where the Royal Navy comes in, because the Royal Navy is so dominant that it's capturing thousands and then tens of thousands of enemy sailors, French and Spanish initially. So Britain ends up with a huge surplus. It's got tons more of these prisoners than France or Spain can take of British prisoners, right? So what do you do? Well, Britain is like, well, we need to hold on to them. We've not really got anywhere to put them. So in the 18th century, there's a bunch of like ramshackle kind of like adapted buildings, you know, like old country houses or whatever that get converted into jails, nothing purpose built. So then in the 1790s, close to where I am now up in Peterborough, Britain builds its first purpose built prison of war, which is called Norman Cross. They build it out of wood, which is a really good option. When the war ends in 1815, what they do with the prison is they take down all the wood and they sell it as firewood. <laughs> now, that's a very <laughs> environmentally friendly way to do a prison. Now, let's go to Dartmoor, which is built about 10 years later. So they start building it in 1806 and it's finished in 1809. They built it in granite. Now, Daz, the question you will ask is, why would they build a temporary prison out of granite, right? <laughs> um, I have absolutely no idea. Firstly, you've got to get it there. Um, oh, okay. So you just nailed it. 
there's a lot of granite fairly close by. Okay. But the reason that they don't use wood is that at that stage in 1806, they need, I know this is going to sound nuts, they need all of the wood to build new ships and to repair oh, the ships yes, they already have. Yes. So bizarrely, granite turns out to be an easier material to get hold of and to use than wood. But it's a bit bizarre because you can see from the images you've got up on the screen right now, the one on the left is the stone archway. So that image, uh, it, that's what it would have looked like when people went into the prison on that first day back in May of 1809. There are about four or five hundred French prisoners that were marched through that gate back then. If you look on the right hand side of the picture, you've got the aerial view of the modern prison. There are some bits of that prison that were there back then, but the biggest difference between now and then is that the modern prison, so the one that was rebuilt in 1853 for criminals, has individual cells. And if you go all the way back to 1809, there were these five big prison blocks, but they were basically almost like warehouses. So there were three floors. The floors were open plan. Yeah, so there you are. That's, that's, that's exactly it. That's actually a couple of years later. So moving on to 1812, when they added two extra prison blocks. But the top of that picture, you can see if you count around from the left, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven prison blocks. So those prison blocks didn't have cells. They basically just had these big wide open floors. There'd be these poles running down the middle. And the idea would be that the sailors would sling up their hammocks and they would sleep there at night. And then the hammocks would come down during the day. And so it's just a big open space, basically. So that's the place that the prisoners ended up. Now, again, like it's about 15 miles north of Plymouth. So it's pretty close to the biggest naval base in Britain. It's a very convenient place in that sense. But in every other respect, it's the middle of nowhere. The weather is terrible. People at the time said it was so bad that even Scottish people thought the weather was bad. Like, <laughs> I'm not even kidding. Like Everybody would be like, this is a nightmarish place oh, no. to put a prison, right? <laughs> but it was put there specifically with the thought that this is going to be better for prisoners than the alternative, which on the south coast was prison hulks. So again, you probably know a bit about these, but basically these old naval vessels where you just stuff prisoners in and then you lash them to the shore, really unsanitary, actually quite expensive to maintain. Prisoners would die all the time of disease. Dartmoor was supposed to be the more humane option. And in some ways, it turned out to be anything but. But again, when these guys arrive at this um, ominous gate and then also, like you said, in the middle of nowhere, it must have been, it must have felt like, you know, the end of their life. Well, yeah, it took a whole day to get there from Plymouth. So you have to basically go uphill. You're marched all the way from Plymouth under this tight military guard. One weird thing about this period and one weird thing about being a prisoner of war is you could actually bring stuff with you. So in a strange kind of way, like there'd be wagons that would go behind with people's trunks, you know, like the trunks that they would carry around with them, the chests that would have like a sailor's belongings. They were actually allowed to bring all that stuff with them. So in a strange kind of way, you weren't like completely left without anything at all. And if you had money or if you had like a rich relative or friend, you could actually find ways to get money into the prison. And that becomes kind of a big part of my story in a way. But basically, yeah, the, the thing that kills you, Daz, is not necessarily just being in a super bleak place. It's that you have no idea when the war is going to end. So again, like whenever you if, you, if you commit a crime and a judge tells you what your sentence is, that could be terrible, but at least you have some idea of how long you might serve, right? Whereas for these guys, they didn't know if they'd be out next week or like in a decade. Yeah, it must have been horrendous. Um, so let's actually move, because I know you've touched on it a little bit earlier on, but let's look at the circumstances and talk about the circumstances that bring these guys, in particular the American prisoners to Dartmoor. Who oh. are they, their backgrounds? And again, why are they there in the first place? Yeah, I felt very sorry for these guys in a way. Um, I mean, the first thing to say about sailors, so, so you have to sort of hold on to two things here, right? So sailors generally are a lot more kind of, um, they're a really mixed bunch. So you know, it's true even now, right? So like, let's say, I don't know, have you ever been on a cruise, Daz? Have you ever done that kind of thing? Not, not, not yet, no. Well, look, you get older and then you'll go on a cruise, right? It yeah, happens to all of us. <laughs> so like, if you go on a cruise, you know, like you look around the crew, they're like from all over the place, right? Yes. Yeah, and like maybe the flag on the cruise liner is like Panama or Liberia yeah, cool. or something like, what the hell's going on? So so this is because of a long tradition at sea, which is that the sea tends to be a place where people from lots of countries come together. Now, very often they're running away from their own country or very often in a way the sea becomes a bit of a country of itself, right? By on its own. So, yeah. for example, for our story, you've probably got about 20 percent of the sailors who are on these ships, these American ships were black. Now, some of those may have been African-American. 
Some of them could have been from the Caribbean. Some of them could have come straight from Africa. It's really hard for us to know where they would have come from. And similarly, like some of the American sailors who were white, not all of them were actually from the US. Some of them could have been from France or from Denmark or from Sweden. And we'll get to this a bit later on about how we can kind of disentangle where they all come from. But this is just to say they're under the American flag, but they're very often multinational crews. But during a time of war, when you get captured under the American flag, you're American. So in a weird kind of way, one of the things I get into in the book is, you know, there's lots of reasons that these guys ended up fighting in the War of 1812, which are not necessarily about being like big American patriots, like they basically need to eat, right? If you're a sailor, either you go to fight in the War of 1812, or you starve. There's not jobs on land or anything else. So I came to have a sort of fondness for these guys, because to me, they're like regular people in this really extraordinary situation. They end up getting captured by the British. And then at that point, even if they're not American, they're seen as American. And again, they're stuffed because they're going to be there until the war ends. So, so this huge number of them. So like I said, between maybe 10 and 15,000 of them end up getting captured. And eventually, as the war moves on, they are all concentrated on Dartmoor. So originally, they're put in prisons all over the place. There's a prison in Canada. There's one in Barbados. There's one in Bermuda. There's one in Cape Town. There's one in Calcutta. Like They're all over the world, these prisons, right? But then as you get towards the end of the War of 1812, in 1814, they all get sent back to Dartmoor. So it kind of becomes like the bottom of the slope right it's the grimmest place that all the americans end up being put wow it's a fascinating story it really is and again the british have to get rid of these people because otherwise if not they'll just go back to fighting against them anyway won't they so it's a bit like you know that's what they have to do yeah and it's also i mean so napoleon had this idea that britain would end up actually being screwed over by taking all of these prisoners because it would drain away troops to guard them and also because, of course, it would cost Britain a lot of money. So a lot of French people were really annoyed at Napoleon because like, if you were captured, it was almost like Napoleon wasn't very interested in getting you back because he thought that the war would kind of continue with you as a prisoner. Like you could basically be a kind of, you know, fighting for the French by being a British prisoner because it would mean that Britain's resources are being drained and distracted to look after you. That was like one theory of what was going on. But I'm much more inclined to think that Britain thought you know, I mean, if we're taking these men out of the, um, the war, particularly sailors, because being a sailor is a real skill, right? So if we can actually take these men like off the battlefield, off the oceans, then really that's going to help us in the war effort. But uh, yeah, it was really dismal for these guys because most of them, I mean, they're not criminals, right? I mean, all they've been doing is they've not even been fighting in the Navy, most of them. They've actually just carried on on their commercial ships, which have been dragged into the war because the US didn't want to build a Navy. So I felt a real sort of, um, yeah. you know, it's whenever you see people in a bind, you feel that sort of empathy. And I really felt that for these. Yeah. And, and again, like you just mentioned, you know, that they, they, they haven't got any choice in the matter. They have no, absolutely to do not. this. Yeah. Um, OK, let's move into um, onto the conditions inside these big prison blocks for these guys, because obviously having that many. So how many men are, are, are crammed into these uh, big blocks? Well, so this is the funny thing. So the photo that you've got up there right now, like for those people who are watching on YouTube, so I'll just describe it if you're listening to the podcast. Basically, Daz has got up a kind of cell with a barred window. There's like a bed on the side. Is that is that a toilet? I don't know why it's in the middle. And I think that's actually from Dartmoor a Museum. I'm not 100 OK, so here's the deal. That will have been after Dartmoor gets turned into yes. a criminal prison. Cool. So basically, you're showing us something that looks a bit like a cell, or it might be one of the like rooms that they would examine prisoners in or whatever else but as i said to you a minute ago the weird thing about the prisoners conditions is that within these seven large prison blocks you would get anything between a thousand and fifteen hundred men so you basically would get as many as 500 per floor and these prison blocks are not that wide but they are pretty long they're not quite as long as a football field but they're pretty long so you basically would have these 1500 men crammed into each one of these prison blocks but here's the funny thing there were these fences in between the different prison blocks but they're also gates that were usually open during the day so the weird part about this is that if you're in one of these blocks you would actually be able to visit the other blocks during the day so you wouldn't just be stuck in your prison block unless somebody had done something to annoy the prison governor in which case there'd be a kind of lockdown and this is a big part of the story for our americans because to begin with 
they're stuck in the part of the prison where the very worst, the most depressed and like dangerous French prisoners are. And that bit of the prison is locked down. So actually for the first like 10 months or so that the Americans are in Dartmoor, there are about a thousand of them who are in this first contingent. They actually don't get to leave their block. And this is why they're really upset and they're desperate to get out. Because um, one other thing I should say about their conditions is that there's also a prison market. So every morning, from nine until 12, in the sort of central yard of the prison, all these traders from the local villages will come in and they'll try and sell stuff to the prisoners. So you obviously want to be at that prison market yard so you can go off and buy things. You can also sell things to the traders. We could talk a bit, if you like, about what the prisoners made and sold. But anyway, that's basically the way that new things come into the prison. So don't get me wrong, guys, there's a lot of despair. The weather is terrible. You get diseases. You have this incredible gnawing uncertainty about whether you're ever going to be released. But there is also a lot more, well, should we call it freedom? I don't know, leeway than you'd get like in a regular criminal prison. Like These guys have more freedom than the people who are at Dartmoor right now, yes, who are obviously in their individual cells. And uh, so if there is all these people and all these different uh, you know people from nationalities is there some like gangs and type that sort of thing going on and like uh, coalitions and stuff yeah, like I mean, that going on? So, the, so the book is full, my book's full of that so like that was for me one of the most interesting things to try and find out but i would also like you know your listeners or your viewers going to be i think if you're interested in history then in a way like one of the things that really challenges us as historians is like how do you tell the story of a place like this right so like if you want to go off and write a book as i've just done about this prison what kinds of things can you turn to that can help you get the story straight well there's a whole bunch of different sources right one of them is the memoirs which prisoners would publish sometimes many years later so actually there's probably about seven or eight prisoners who produce either books or they produce articles that get published in magazines and journals so they talk all about their experience in the prison that's one source you could also potentially go off and look at journals and diaries that were written at the time we haven't got as many of those but we have got some so actual journals and diaries that prisoners kept in the prison in real time that's kind of like the gold mine here in terms of a kind of source you could also look at the records of the british so you could see the letters that the prison governor was writing to his bosses in london see the kinds of things that people were talking about on the british side and then maybe finally and this is where i really geeked out and again Daz, you're going to think i'm such a loser there's basically a giant prison register the prison register has got six and a half thousand names in it. So during COVID, I just went off and transcribed it all. I've got no life. Mate, just, I just, would you know. never, ever think that of you. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm a geeky historian as well. And <laughs> I would have done exactly the same thing. And my podcast started during the first lockdown. So Is that right? Go. Yes. <laughs> well, I tell you, so, so this is an amazing source, right? Because you, you haven't just got six and a half thousand names. You've got the uh, place of birth. You've got the age of the sailor or the prisoner. You've got where they were captured, the ship they were on, the ship that captured them. But get this, you've also got their height, which is sometimes quite helpful. You've yeah. got their distinguishing features. And there's a category called complexion. And the complexion category for me was like amazing because basically this is a place where you could see how many were black or yeah. how many were people of color as opposed to white people, right? You've also got what happens to them in the prison. So if they're released, if they're killed, if they die, you also have other things sort of written on the top by the uh, clerks at the prison. So anyway, that source for me was amazing. So to write the book, I had to go off and think about those four different kinds of sources and yeah. see where they would line up. So to get back to your question about gangs, what I discovered is that in the published accounts that came out years later, all of the sailors were like, oh, we all loved each other. <laughs> we were all loyal Americans. You know, we were all basically on the same side. If you go off and you look at the diaries and the journals, or you look at the prison register, or the letters that are being sent back to London by the governor, it's a much more fractious situation. So you've got all kinds of divisions. You've got the people that were in the US Navy, the small number of those guys, being very, very suspicious of a lot of the other sailors. You've got racial divisions. You've got divisions between people from different parts of the US. And you've got a bunch of Americans saying that other prisoners are not actually American, but are British, which they may well have been, are just on American ships. So you have all kinds of fault lines and arguments. And so there's some solidarity in the prison, but there's also a lot of division as well. But it's just great that all these records were available, really. So is, are these, a lot of these records kept at the prison? 
No, so most of the stuff you can find is in London. So the National okay, Archives yeah. has gobbled most of it up. But I yeah. should have said, I mean, to get back to this challenge of how you tell the story. So uh, one of the things about the story that to me is totally nuts, so we can maybe get into this, is the fact that I mentioned before about 20% of sailors at the time on American ships were black. So there's about a thousand of the six and a half thousand prisoners who are black, right? But yes. all of the accounts that we have, so whether it's like um, a published memoir, a diary, maybe somebody wrote a letter to their newspaper, uh, all of those accounts are by white people. So we've not got a single account of what happened at Dartmoor by one of these black people uh, who was in a prison. So again, for me, that was a really interesting challenge because obviously there's a lot of prejudice back then about black people. So how yes. do you kind of get the truth away from all the stuff that white people said about black people? And that for me, again, was a big challenge in writing the book. Yeah. And uh, one person you do focus on is a man called Frank Palmer. Yeah. So please tell us a little bit about uh, about this guy and how he ends up in Dartmoor Prison, please. Yeah, I kind of came to love this guy. Uh, I called him in the book. He's the world's least successful privateersman, by which I mean, like, he's signed up for one of these privatised, like, ships, these merchant ships that are going to go off and supposedly fight all of the British merchant uh, fleet, right? He's from Stonington in Connecticut, pretty small town, not too far from the sea. So he goes off in 1813, fairly young, so he's like 19, uh, goes with his friends, <clears throat> thinks, OK, well, it's going to be fun to go off and fight this war. The moment he sees the ship he's going to be on, he gets second thoughts because <laughs> he thinks the ship looks quite crappy. <laughs> so literally in his, his journal, I should have said that, he's one of the guys we know about because he left us a journal, like a diary. So again, this is one of the reasons I fell in love with him a bit, because you really get to know him because he's written everything down in real time. And you don't think he's making stuff up because you know he wrote it like in the moment, right? Anyway, so he goes off and he's like, oh God, I'm not sure I want to do this, but my friends are saying I should. I mean, you know, Daz, you've had that experience, right? You go out with your friends for a night, they try and get you to do things. You're not sure you should do them. You end up doing them. I mean, well, I'm never... normally the one that's doing them, so. <laughs> <laughs> you probably never signed up for a privateering voyage, but that's what yeah, he did, right? Yeah. So imagine him going out on a bender and becoming a privateersman. And then literally, I'm not even joking, the very first day that he's on this ship, to get into the Atlantic, you have to break the British blockade. So I mentioned earlier, the Royal Navy's got all of these huge ships and they're basically everywhere, just off the American coast. So his little privateering vessel has to break through to get out into the Atlantic. And that's like before it can start doing anything, right? That's supposed to be the easy part, but he actually gets captured the very first night because his ship doesn't get through the blockade. And he is immediately at that point taken to Bermuda, which you'll say sounds really swanky, but if you're in a prison, is not so great. He's held there for months. He's then moved up to Nova Scotia to another British prison. And then eventually in the summer of 1814, he gets dragged to Dartmoor. So again, he's in prison for like 600 days or whatever. He spends just one day as a privateersman before he's captured. So he's become one of my like central characters in the book because, you know, I mean, he had a really miserable time. They did, didn't he? And he's, he's not very lucky. <laughs> he's really well. I mean, he, spoiler alert, he does survive the book. At yeah. least he gets through, like, the end of the war. Yeah, of course, I mean, yeah. it, it, the thing about him is, like, you can really tell at every stage his anxiety that he's not going to make it, right? And he's like, I'm just yeah. a kid. I signed up for this thing. I spent one day as a, as a privateersman or half a day. And I've been a prisoner for two years. So I, I think there's really there's something really poignant about it, also something pretty comic about it, right? But yeah. if you actually get into his diary, you can see that he didn't find a lot of humour in his situation. No, of course not, no. And nobody would ever find humour in that. You know, <laughs> it's awful. Please tell us a little bit more about the prisoner's governor, Thomas Shortland, please. Yeah, sure. So Shortland was a Royal Navy captain. Uh, he basically came in to take over at the prison towards the end of 1813. He was the second governor of the prison. I should have explained earlier that the Royal Navy basically oversaw the prison. So there's a part of the British government called the Transport Board, which is basically responsible for moving things around. So like did a lot of logistics in war, but they were also responsible for prisoners of war and war prisons. So uh, this guy, Thomas Shortland, had been a Royal Navy captain for decades accepted this posting at Dartmoor in 1813. And again, I got really into this because like, if you're a captain at sea, clearly on your ship, you're basically the king, right? You're in charge of everything. But when you accepted one of these jobs to become a prison governor in the British prison system, actually, even though you had a lot more kind of space and you know, it wasn't like being cramped in a way it would be in a captain's cabin on a Royal Navy ship, 
you had to write to London all the time and tell them what you were doing. And they would write to you and give you instructions. And actually, I really felt sorry for the Shortland guy because the transport board, I mean, I don't know if you've ever grappled with bureaucracy or I mean, I think about various bits of the government you might have dealings with, I don't know, like the passport office. I mean, you know, the sort of people you don't think of as being very efficient. The transport board is incredibly efficient, but it's also really efficient. Like these guys will chase down every last penny. They will put you through all kinds of indignities to try and make sure they can save a bit of cash. So our poor governor, Shortland, he's in this weird situation because these guys are not criminals, the sailors, the prisoners. They're not to be treated as criminals. So he's happy to give them a little bit of autonomy, but he also can't give them the reassurance that a prison governor could give a regular criminal prisoner that they know when they're getting out. So he has this group of people under him in the prison that he's responsible for, but he's not really responsible for kind of like mending their morals or looking out for every single tiny thing that they're doing. But of course they see him as being responsible. They see him as being kind of on the hook for everything they experience. And he's grappling with this bureaucracy up in London, which is very comfortable, very distant from all the realities he's going through, but which still feels it can give him orders the whole time. So the story is also partly about like, what, what does it mean to be a man like Shortland, who's a really dedicated servant of Britain and of the Navy, but kind of being pushed around by these like pen pushers up in London? Um, yeah, so April 6, 1815 is a very important incident takes place inside Dartmoor Prison. So please explain a little bit more about that. And also the fact that the War of 1812 at this point is actually over. Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? So the War of 1812 uh, ends. Well, OK, so ending a war back in that period is a complicated business. Uh, there's a bunch of negotiators from the American and British sides who've been in Belgium in the city of Ghent, and they've spent most of 1814 trying to get a treaty. They finally get one on Christmas Eve 1814. Now, that means that the agreement to end the war has been reached. But of course, that agreement has got to be ratified. So it's got to go to London to have the government in Britain ratify it, but it also has to go to Washington to be ratified by the Congress. Now, the terrible thing then is that people in Dartmoor find out pretty much on the last day of the year of 1814, so on New Year's Eve 1814, everyone in Dartmoor knows that the war is basically over. But at that point, Dad, they're still bringing people in in their hundreds. Like American prisoners are still arriving every day at the end of 1814. And of course, they can't be released, they think, until both Britain and the US have ratified the agreement. So Britain does it pretty quickly, but they have to send a boat all the way over to Washington. And then that ship's got to come all the way back again after Congress has said yes. But get this, that all happens. The middle of March 1815, the ship has returned. The news has reached Dartmoor that Congress back in the US has ratified the peace. So everyone there is expecting to leave. And now we've got probably between five and five and a half thousand Americans are still at Dartmoor. The rest have been exchanged in prisoner exchanges, but there are still the vast majority are still stuck there, right? So why aren't they allowed to leave? Well, the US consul, the US diplomat who's been running all of the American affairs during the War of 1812 in London, who's a man from Virginia called Reuben Beasley. He says, OK, well, we probably shouldn't let the Americans out. What we should probably do is arrange an evacuation. We need to get a lot of ships all the way down to Plymouth that can take them all back to the US. So probably best for us just to keep them in the prison until we've got all the ships to evacuate them. Well, if you're a prisoner in Dartmoor, you don't see it that way. <laughs> you want to be released. But the American government and the British government agree that the prisoners should all be kept behind the stone walls until those ships arrive. Well, this is where everything gets super unfortunate because what happens in March of 1815, our little friend Napoleon, our little French buddy, he manages to escape from the island of Elba in the Mediterranean, goes to Paris and basically starts up the war again. So everyone thought the Napoleonic Wars had ended the previous year, back in April of 1814. Now suddenly in March of 1815, the war is back on. What does that mean? It means the British government wants every available ship that it can hire and charter to take men and guns and food across the channel to go off and fight Napoleon again. So our poor Dartmoor guys who have been waiting for this moment where they get the news that the war has been ended by Congress, at that moment, their guy in London, the, the diplomat, this Reuben Beasley guy, he actually cannot hire any ships because they're all being taken by the British government. So they're stuck there. And word starts to leak out to the Dartmoor prisoners that they could be stuck there for a year. So on April the 6th, 1815, 
they all start to freak out. There's a small altercation with the prison guards that snowballs and gets out of control. There's a giant confrontation between hundreds of American prisoners, all unarmed as nobody's got a gun or a weapon or anything on the American side. And these are British guards who are from one of the local militias. One of these militiamen loses his discipline, he shoots. Oh. Then the other militiamen shoot, and then suddenly Americans are falling down left, right, and center. And then the very worst part, and this is where the image you can see on the screen right now really comes in. These militia guards chase our American prisoners back into these seven different prison yards, and they just start killing them. Oh. And they're shooting, shooting, shooting at them. There are like guards on the walls who are shooting as well. Now, again, in fairness to the Brits, the line that they used was that they thought the Americans were trying to escape. Now, in fact, I think that wasn't true. I think what really happened is that people panic, but this happens in war, right? I mean, like war, yeah, yeah, yeah. war is not a good place for anyone to be. And like when you're there, a lot of terrible things can happen. So for nearly an hour, this massacre, as the Americans call it, continues. Nine of the Americans are killed. Between three and four dozen are really seriously injured. So they're gonna lose limbs. They're gonna have like life-changing injuries. The whole thing is a gigantic mess. There's like carnage, blood in the yards. And then that night, one of our Americans, uh, not Frank Palmer, the guy I mentioned earlier, but another American who keeps a journal, he makes a note in his journal. He says, this is a terrible massacre. This massacre is always going to be remembered in American history. No one is ever going to forget us and we will get justice. But that doesn't happen. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's the thing. There's been a few incidents, sorry, over the, over the years where, um, you know, uh, somebody's got, you know, and accidentally squeeze that trigger. I mean, it happened in, in the, uh, the War of Independence, didn't Absolutely. it? You know? Absolutely. So you know, there's like, been a few occasions that this type of thing has happened, you know, where someone's shot and that's it. I mean, war, war, war puts people in a place, any war, every war, puts people in a place where bad things are a lot more likely to happen, right? So, I mean, yes. like, I'm not saying you can avoid it, but when it yeah. happens, the chances of bad things happening increase exponentially. And that was true for these guys. I mean, these guards... Bear in mind that they're militia, so they are not trained to be prison guards. They're basically not really trained to be anything. I mean, they're anything, just local yeah, yeah. people from Somerset who've been drummed into uniform and are now doing guard duty. And, you know, in some ways they were also kind of prisoners, right? Because they were stuck in a barracks. They were forced to serve. They were also in the middle of nowhere with this horrible weather. They had a bit more liberty than the prisoners, but not a lot more. So it's really depressing what happened. But again, the Americans thought they'd be remembered, and instead they were totally forgotten about them. and that story i think is really interesting yeah it's so fascinating i feel so sorry for them poor guys you know um so what is the american government's response and or also the british government's response to hearing about this awful situation uh, bear in mind again ladies and gentlemen that britain have got one eye across the channel at this point you know or maybe right. even two <laughs> well no that's exactly it i mean if you think about it from the american perspective they didn't necessarily want the war of 1812 to begin with it's not been a hugely successful war i mean we've not got into this but back in august of 1814 the royal navy sends an expeditionary force to burn washington dc <laughs> so yeah. I don't mean to laugh, but like, I mean, if you think about it today, yeah. right? Yeah. That idea that we burn the American capital, it's pretty oh, yeah. wild, pretty intense. So the war has not been going all that well for the Americans throughout. So they're actually very happy that the war is over. The last thing that people in Washington want is for the war to begin again. In fact, Washington have already sent a bunch of high level diplomats to London to negotiate a big commercial treaty. So in addition to like the peace treaty, you've already got these diplomat bigwigs in London talking to the British government about the new commercial treaty, effectively setting up a relationship where Britain and America are very close to each other economically, right? That's all going on at the same time. You nailed it, Daz. Like the British, meanwhile, are really worried about Napoleon. The last thing they want is to open the war with the Americans again. So for different reasons, the Americans and the British kind of come together and they're like, well, we need to do an investigation. Let's do that first of all. But then when the investigation happens, the two sides decide nothing to see here, really unfortunate, oh. but we can't really figure out who pulled the trigger. Probably nobody gave an order, really regrettable, but we shouldn't have any criminal prosecutions. Move on, nothing to see, nothing to see. And that's it. Then it kind of ends in the summer of 1815. And these American sailors who were still in the prison until July, many of them, they're basically finding out that their government and the British government have come together and have decided to kind of memory hole this whole event. And obviously they're mad about this, but I mentioned earlier, these guys are sailors, right? 
So their whole profession involves them being away from the United States. So if you want to screw over a bit of your population, screwing over sailors is probably the very best idea because these guys are away from the country the whole time. So yeah. a lot of these people have not got the time or the means to stay in the US and fight for a pension or for compensation or for an inquiry or all the stuff that we want people to have. That's not their lifestyle. So effectively, once the two governments have decided to move on, these sailors are totally stuck. And so nobody at all is held accountable for this at all. No, nobody, whatever. In fact, the Prince uh, Regent, so the future George IV, he makes an offer to the American government and says, look, I'm willing to give you some compensation. The American government declines it because they're worried that that will make it look as if they've basically you know, decided that they're going to shake hands with Britain like in the open. They're doing all the shaking hands behind the scenes, but they don't want to like, accept the compensation offer because then they're worried they'll get more of a public outcry uh, in Britain, in the US rather. So no compensation for Britain. There is a little bit of money that gets given by the American government to those who were maimed or the families of those who were killed. But everyone else who was in the prison, not only do they not get anything, they don't even get like access to a pension, they don't get any land, they don't get any kind of funds, whatever. And in fact, what the guys do, what the, the former prisoners do is they start to form associations in the 40s and the 50s, the 1840s and 50s, where they're like trying to remember Dartmoor, and they petition Congress. And they are still petitioning the US Congress in 1871, where there's like dozens of them only left alive to try and get some money to compensate them for fighting the War of 1812 for the US. And what does Congress say? Nope, <laughs> we're not yeah. interested. You guys aren't important. So they're also kind of, I mean, they're, they're betrayed in two ways, right? They're betrayed by, by their government, but they're also betrayed by history because I should have said this before, Daz. These are the last Americans to be killed in a war between Britain and the United States. Yeah, of course. So the weird thing about 1815 is it's basically the last year in which we Brits are fighting the French and the Americans. And I just want to emphasize that for a second, because if you think about like the 18th century, Britain and France are fighting each other all the time. Mm -hmm. Since the 1760s, Brits and Americans have been at each other's throats before, during and after the American Revolution. Nobody in 1815 thinks that like these wars are going to end forever but that's exactly what happens so our poor nine americans who are killed and all the wounded and the injured and all the survivors they're marooned by history because their story of being screwed over by britain is no longer convenient we've got the beginning of the special relationship we like to think of britain and the united states as being friends not enemies but these guys are on the wrong side of history and they end up never being remembered yeah until you come along it's great <laughs> which is fantastic which i love you know um so okay after after they are released so again talk a little bit about their release and, and where do they go off to do they go home to america do they go home to where they're from yeah but that's really sad too so we don't know for sure exactly how many made it back to the united states so what we've got is we know the ships that the u.s government arranged to take them home and very often these weren't american ships they were like russian ships or danish ships basically any ship the americans could get their hands on they sent to plymouth and used for the evac operation one thing we know is that a lot of those ships were going to like the wrong place for the prisoners. So what tended to happen is that this American uh, consul, this guy Reuben Beasley in London, basically if he could like send a ship to Virginia where it could pick up tobacco for him, <laughs> he would do that. So he wasn't concerned about where the prisoners wanted to go. He was thinking about destinations that suited him and his commercial interests. So incredibly, these evacuation ships in the middle of the Atlantic, a lot of them were actually like hijacked by the prisoners. So the crew of the ship were overpowered by the American prisoners who decided then they'd sell them to Boston or to New York or to Philadelphia or New London or most of the prisoners are from northern states. The ships were supposed to be going to southern states. So they just took them over. So I find that part of the story like incredible. But then when these guys got back, let's say your ship gets back to Boston and you live in New York, there's no help from the government. So you basically have to walk from Boston to New York. So cool. you have to walk hundreds of miles. Some of these <clears> sailors <throat> are like begging in the streets for money. You know, their feet are all cut up. They basically bled for their country. Yeah. But now when they're returned, no sympathy, no support. So like the story of them being kind of screwed over just carries on the moment they get back. Yeah, these poor guys, you know. Oh. 
Well, okay. I mean, look, it's, it's a different time, right? I mean, you think about yeah. the government now. I mean, yeah. governments are much bigger now than they used to be back yeah. there. But this is an era where the government, in effect, asks you to risk everything, but doesn't have a lot of capacity or interest in rewarding you for all the risks that you've taken. So I don't know. It's also a story I think about these people who've given a lot, but then get a little bit stranded or a little bit betrayed by the government they thought they were fighting for. Yeah, of course. Um, anyway, let's move on to your on to your actual book then, mate, because uh, it's an amazing book and uh, it's, it's only just recently come out. Is that correct? Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, it came out last month uh, here in the UK and also over in the US. So I've been talking about it over here and over there. And um, I hope people are interested in this period of history. will find it really. I mean, there's a lot going on in this prison that we not talked about. I mean, there's casinos, there's theatres, there's like religion, all the cliches from your favourite prison novel or movie, like, you know, prison, your uniforms tunneling to try and get out everyone being worried that someone's going to give up the tunnel like all the stuff you expect from things like the great escape or bridge over the river Kwai, or like all of that stuff is here it's incredible to see the origins of all those stories in dartmoor prison would you say it's your favorite book you've ever researched and put together i've never i'll be honest i've never written a book before about like an event like I usually yeah. tend to write books that are a bit more about big ideas and yeah. they tend to be on a like bigger canvas. And my wife said to me when I started this book, Daz, are you sure you should write this book? Because you're actually going to have to know something for a change. And she was so right. Like I really had to try and find out about this particular place at this particular time. And it was so much fun to write. I really, really enjoyed doing and, it. And again, how hard is it to get to those resources that you needed to actually be able to put this together during that period of COVID as well? Well, I'd done a little bit. I started work on the book in 2017. So I'd done a lot of the archive stuff. So like go down to London. I mean, again, it's Britain, right? So you know how bureaucratic we are. I mean, pretty much like we're, we're bureaucracy is like in our veins as Brits very often. So like you go down to London and of course you find all these folders containing all this correspondence with the government. And so I went through all that before COVID. I got all of my like letters from sailors and stuff before COVID. And crucially, I got those big scans of the prison register. So I basically had all that material before COVID started. And in fact, the weird thing is, I started writing the book in January of 2020. And I wrote all the way through until May of 2020. So in a weird way, when COVID happened, I just moved from my office where I'm talking to you from now to the shed at the bottom of my garden. And it was so weird, Daz, because I know you're going to find this a bit this may sound a bit forced, but I genuinely felt like back at that time in March of 2020, felt a little bit like we were all prisoners, right? Because we were yeah, all yeah, 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 I get what you mean. Yes. And, and also, we weren't totally sure the government was going to save us. No, <laughs> so, no, that's why. Yeah. But it was a bit of an analogy in the writing process. Yeah, of course. But also, I found that over that period, there's so many people that was in your same position that have ended up either writing a book or really heavily getting involved in something and now you know like myself podcasting or whatever you know um so in a way although it was a horrible situation for everyone covid um there are some good things that came out of it for others you know well i just hope people like you and like the other folks who took up doing something new when this is going on stick out it because yeah. I mean, now we're like not back to normal but you know like things are different yeah. now, right they're a little bit more back to what they were the temptation is to lose track of like what you said not so much the good things that happened but the way that people were resourceful and the way that people use that time to think about how they could change things in their life for. they could just do things because they didn't have other options they found new options and so yeah i totally hope that people carry on doing all the stuff they did back then because there's a lot of valuable stuff that went on despite all the pain and all the suffering and the same is true at dartmoor in a strange way i mean again like a lot of what happened in that prison is really valuable and interesting and important it's not all about the tragedy and sometimes exceptional circumstances allow for exceptional things to happen yeah um just a quick shout out to the publisher so how helpful were they uh, towards you one world yeah awesome so i've got a publisher in america called basic and a one world in london and um again you probably have a lot of authors who've written for publishers like in two different places but it's fun as an author because you basically get to work with two different teams so I got a bunch of people in the American office in New York, a bunch of people in London. They basically all read the book and they give you different perspectives on it. So the text of the book is the same for Americans and for Brits. So actually, that's also a bit of a challenge, right? Because, you know, we yeah. know different things. We talk about things in different ways. So yeah. there's an effort to try and like put it out on the page in a way that means that all our readers from both places will be able to follow along. So who's the publisher in the state? Sorry, because this will be going out to a lot. Yeah, of yeah. so basic books in New York. And actually, the funny thing, Daz, is that the cover is different in America. OK, cool. But the, you, you find that with, uh, um, you know, stuff that's released in America. Sometimes you do have to have a slightly different uh, approach to it. 
Well, it's, it's, it, to me, again, it's been such a pleasure to work with those two teams. Um, yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, and again, just to feel that this is a story that belongs to Brits and to Americans. So I'm just going to bring up your other books because you have uh, written, like you said, uh, you have written a fair few. I've written a few, it's true. And uh, most of it's on American history, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. So get, just give us a little overview of all, you know what you've actually done in the, in the past. Uh, yeah, so um, I've written, like, this is my third book that's basically a full-on history book. So uh, the book you see there, the second one along, which is about how Americans kind of came to think God loved them more than everyone else. That book, Providence and the Invention of the United States, I wrote that back in 2008. Uh, that book that's fourth along, Bind Us Apart, is a book about how Americans, after the American Revolution, dealt with the fact there were a lot of black people and Indians in the US. And, you know, all men are created equal, this big idea of equality. How are they going to reconcile that with the fact that they have these prejudices towards people of color? So that's what that book is about. The, the first and the third book there, I wrote those back towards the beginning of my career. So I did a lot of volunteer work when I was at university out in the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip. And in conjunction with a human rights activist out in Israel, Palestine, I put together that book uh, about Israel. That was the first book that I did about the peace process. Um, so that to me was an amazing, exercise and just like figuring out how to write a book similarly the third book there another american century did for the same publisher back in 2000 a little book on like um, what was happening in the world in the 1990s basically between the cold war and the war on terror so those are really good fun to write but the one at the end have a nice doomsday which looks like the trashiest i mean like anyone who's listening or you know watching this who's like into like religious stuff in the u.s this is a book about the people in the u.s who think that the world is going to end and think that that's a good thing <laughs> so <laughs> it's about the people who believe in the end times and all that kind of apocalyptic stuff and it's part history book but it's also part road trip because i went off and spent yeah. a lot of time in the u.s going off and talking to these guys which was incredibly interesting so it's a bunch of conversations with people like you think the world's going to end like do you pay your taxes do you tax your car you know do you get insurance just these kind of amazing conversations that people are really active over there in that movement so so i've done a lot of different things and it's been a real privilege to write different kinds of books over my career okay well cool what, what's next for nick Write a little book uh, with a colleague of mine at the University of Virginia about Thomas Jefferson, who's a bit of a player in, um, in this book and in my last book, but about him and slavery. So maybe, again, some of your listeners and viewers will know that uh, Thomas Jefferson famously said a lot about how he hated slavery, but also failed to free his own slaves. and was actually in a sexual relationship with one of his enslaved people for like 30 years. So we're going to get into that in the book and try and explain all the different ideas Jefferson had for ending slavery and why they all fell apart. So I'm hoping that's going to be really interesting. It's a sad story, but a really interesting story. And that's going to come out in a couple of years. OK, cool. So everyone, um, just uh, like I said, in the description, you will find links to uh, Nick's new book. You will also find a link to a really interesting. Uh, so you have a, a presentation you did on YouTube. I think it was like we was a talking one. So oh, yeah. I'll put that up as well. So people can go and watch it because it's it's got a little bit more detail about the, the hated cage in there. Um, but all I can say, mate, is I've been an absolute pleasure talking to you. And I thank you very much for coming on. Thank you so much, Dad. It's been a real privilege and good luck with the podcast and keep this up. All right. Cheers. Thank you. All right.